So when I put this talk together, uh, I put it together on the back side of another talk that I had done, uh, learning from my friends uh, that do DEF CON series. Uh, I wanted a series of talks, so uh, this one follows I hacked the garage door opener, and it's uh, how hard it is to tell a garage door opener company that I had done that. Um, so this is me. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm Jason at HackersForCharity.org. If you don't know about Hackers for Charity, uh, it has a little to do with my t-shirt I have on. Um, I've spent an awful lot of time in Africa bringing technology to people that have zero uh, and supporting technology in places where that's really hard to do. Um, I've hung out with a bunch of the crew that uh, lived in Uganda for a long time. Um, as you can see, Hackers with Tractors is a hashtag I'm trying to get pumped up. I think there's two of us now. I know Frank's one of them. Um, you know, I turned my John Deere into a DEF CON Deere this, this year. I put all my DEF CON stickers on it. Good stuff. Um, I'm hacking like it's 1998. I threw my first malicious tick mark at a website in 98. Uh, my wife came home and said, this guy named Bob O'Neill broke my application. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, because of the apostrophe. And I was like, all right, time to throw some apostrophes around. Um, and you know the rest is history. I started reading a lot of books about it and doing as much as I could, uh, following much the path the guy before me was talking about, where you, you know, learn about stuff and then you start educating about stuff and off you go. Uh, I'm a charity guy, uh, so this year my trip to Africa, I built a methane biodigester out of industrial waste that I found in Uganda. Um, so this is, you know, I'm not only uh, hacking websites, but I also do stuff like. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if you didn't have to buy firewood anymore? Um, some fair warning here. Uh, I showed this talk to my boss, and he said, this talk needs more Star Wars. Um, and so I tried to put some in. Uh, maybe you'll be able to see it. I don't know. Um, if you're looking to hire, raise your hand. Is anybody looking to hire? No? Nobody's got open job recs? I'm sure there's plenty of people that are looking for jobs, but you might be sitting next to your colleague, and if you say that you are, that guy's looking to hire right there, he's going to black ball that one. Uh, what for? Web application penetration testing. Web app pen testing, you? Uh, Red Hat Consultants. Red Hat Consultants, you? Security analyst. Security analyst. Jobs. There's jobs, guys. Uh, don't, you know, if, if you're looking for a job, go talk to these guys. Um, it's pretty easy to just chat with them about stuff. Um, if you want to learn about what it is that I do, uh, when I'm not standing in front of people rambling, um, I'm pretty easily to, easily hired. Uh, any place that serves pizza and beer serves as a good venue for this. Uh, I'll happily sit down and uh, tell you about my time in the Navy or whatever. If you want to learn about the research flaw talk, um, if you want to see what I had done, all the bits and pieces to hack into my garage door opener, uh, that's on LASCON's website. Uh, if you go to the LASCON YouTube channel, I'm the guy that's the picture that is the channel picture. I don't know why they did that. They could have picked a better guy for that for sure. Um, but, you know, there it is. Uh, everybody talks about Equifax, and uh, at this point, I kind of consider them protected class corporate citizens. We shouldn't make fun of them anymore. They are, they all know. Um, if you want to come talk to me after the talk, I, I want to hear from you. Who's first con? One, two. Four, five, quite a few people in the room. I'm seeing more and more people, first con, right? I'm not standing in front of the same faces anymore. It's great. All right, so let's dig into this thing. Is your company ready to receive this letter, this phone call, this tweet, uh, this email, right? You have a security flaw, and I would like to tell you about it. Well, I did this, right? I called a company and said, I have found a security flaw. Now, in my case, it was a security flaw that I was extremely concerned with. I could open my garage door, right? How many of you live in a house where your primary entrance is your garage door? There's several, right? That man door between your garage and your house, do you ever lock that? Yeah, on accident, now and then, right? <laughs> Where's the key for that thing? Um, I really wanted to understand, did I have some kind of IoT thing that was giving me problems, right? Because uh, I plugged all this stuff in in my house, and just like you guys, you know, I wanted my light bulbs to be a different color. I wanted to know if my garage was open or closed at night. I wanted to set up a system that would tell me, hey, if it's after midnight and my garage door is open, go close your garage door, right? Um, gives me a little button to do it. So I thought it'd be fun, right? 
So I sat down with a little bit of curiosity and a black hoodie, um, because that's how you do that, and I started hacking away, right? I started looking around. What are the things that are out there? That turns out turning on your light bulbs and getting the Bluetooth to give you your Wi-Fi password is interesting, right? That's very interesting. It's extremely applicable. However, if you're in my house pulling my Wi-Fi password off my Bluetooth light bulb, you're in my house already, right? I wanted to know, can I let, get into the house, right? I really wanted to understand that. So I looked around and I said, what do I got connected to the cybers, right? What did we plug in and forgot that we plugged in? And then I wanted to understand, could I cause some kind of harm or loss if there was something there? And so I sat down in my driveway and I pulled out my phone and I hooked up something called Burp Suite in my laptop and I pointed my phone at it and I started watching the traffic that everything was generating. I found out that my camera that was sitting on my mantle in my house is constantly beaconing out the position that my phone has told the service I'm at, right? That's something I'm not really that excited about. I also found out that that service that I'm running off that camera in my house is reading my email because it's giving me very specific suggested ads based on my insurance company that it knows about. And I know that because I see it in the communication stream, right? Um, and so I wanted to understand how many of these things? So I opened my garage door up, I, I captured it in burp, I sent the replay, and the garage closed, right? I fiddled with the uh, position setting. The garage closed, I opened it, I closed it. And then I started doing standard AppSec pen testing stuff. Are they tearing sessions down? Can I move the session? Well, I want to understand, could I open someone else's garage remotely? That's really the thing that I wanted to do. Attack the API layer, open someone else's garage. Can anybody tell me what the research problem is with sitting in my driveway opening someone else's garage? <laughs> I can't figure out if it worked, right? <laughs> I have no idea if it's functioning correctly. But the good news is there's Twitter. So I tweeted out, hey, does anybody have you know, one of these kinds of garage door openers? A buddy of mine in California is like, yeah, I totally have exactly the same one. Like, all right, here's how you install Burp, here's how you put cert on your phone, right? Here's how you open your garage. Now give me these data elements, and I started manipulating it. I couldn't open his garage with my session. I was happy about that. But the replay attack was enough for me to call Chamberlain and say, hey guys, I think I found something. So what if they found something? If you are looking at your organization and thinking, oh no, a researcher may call me. The answer is they will. It doesn't matter what you put in your end user license agreement that says don't hack our stuff or security test it. Uh, it turns out that safety always trumps any crap you put in there, right? Uh, so if my goal is to make people more safe, I can hack you all I want, right? If that's really my goal and what I'm gonna do. But there's some caveats to that, right? I have to report it to you. I have to go through responsible disclosure, that kind of stuff, um, but it's okay. Yeah, I'll also have to understand that they're going to call, right? It's going to happen. So who are they going to call? Well, in my case, I couldn't figure it out. Went to their website. There's no abuse at. There's no security anything. There's no nothing, right? Their APIs didn't have anything in the headers to say, hey, if you're banging on this, let us know. Um, nothing, right? Who do you call in this situation? Anybody guess? The 800 number on the side of the box that it came in, right? That's all I got, so I called them. And I got a customer service agent, right? And they were very willing to help with resetting the pin on the little box on the outside of the house, because they have to do that all the time. Take the battery out, you have to, yeah, no. I don't need the box, I can open the door without it, right? I need to talk to someone else, right? <laughs> um, and so I looked around and looked around and looked around and I, couldn't figure it out, and it turns out in our industry, we have no standard way for reporting. There's no standard way for the environment to set itself up so that I'll know who to report to, and there's no standard way for a researcher to go looking for reporting. It's kind of a bummer. Um, if they get through, what's gonna happen, right? There's probably no training. There's probably no one inside your organization that knows what to do if somebody goes, you got this bug, right? Um, it's going to be difficult 
So what we want to try to do is smooth this out a little bit. And the way you usually smooth things out like this is you have some kind of plan, right? So this is the uh, bomb threat checklist that the FBI produces, right? And on this checklist, it's like, what's the, you know, where's the bomb? When's it going to explode? They go through all this. They give you lots of room to write, you know, where is it? When's it going to explode? Then down here, the exact wording of the threat, right? Over here, it's, you're supposed to fill this out and say who you called, right? But there's really nothing else in, who am I supposed to call if somebody calls in a bomb threat? Get everybody out of the building, right? That's not stated on there anywhere. The FBI wants to go find the person that built the bomb. They built this checklist. Right? They, they're not here to try to help get you out of the building. They're here to figure out who built the bomb because they want to go arrest them. You've got to have a good set of policies and procedures, a good understanding of where they're going to go. So a good place to start is by simply putting it on your website. Right? When you load up any website today, there's a little icon that appears in the tab. Well, that happens because we've all agreed that if you put this one thing in this one place, the browser will put it there, right? Well, why can't we have the same thing? So security.txt is an idea, right? Why can't I just go to your domain slash security.txt and I'll see who I can send an email to, maybe your PGP key there, um, so that I can you know, encrypt the data that I'm sending. There's one possibility. There's already organizations that communicate with developers, with anybody that has a little bit of understanding today. This is the Etsy store's website. Is code your craft? Etsy.com slash careers, right? This is a header. You don't see this anywhere on the page. You have to be looking for this, right? <laughs> but there it is. So since I'm here already, I'm gonna be looking at your website in Burp Suite. That's happening, right? That's how I browse the web, so it's happening. Um, so while I'm there, you might as well give me a way to get a hold of you. It'd be a really great idea, right? I mean, we figured out a long time ago that these crawlers that are going around the internet, we want to make sure they don't go to certain parts of our website because maybe there's sensitive data there that you don't want to index and have people search later. Um, so in this case, we've got, you know, I pick on United a lot. If anybody follows me on Twitter, I'm sorry, I'm always picking on United on there. Uh, but this is United's disallow page, and it's only some of it, uh, for robots.txt. What does this tell an attacker to do? <laughs> this is the first place, right? Uh, there's a few guys in a room that are ex-Navy. Every time we pull into a new port, they publish a list of bars you weren't allowed to go to, right? The first one on the list is always where you ended up passed out at. <laughs> but if we're going to have robots.txt, why don't we have humans.txt, right? Like, direct me around. Here's where maybe if you find an error message or something, you could report it back to me. I mean, there's got to be some way that we can communicate with each other. Pick one. I don't care which one, right? Just make it a little easier for the researcher to t contact you. Now, if they're going to go side channel like I did, I had to, maybe you call a customer service line. Train them, <laughs> you know? Swing by. Hey, if somebody calls and says they're having a security issue, you know, maybe we should do things with that. Perhaps a little rewards-based drilling, right? Just simply call in one day. And if they ask you this question, get them pizza or whatever. I don't know, right? <laughs> I'm, what I'm trying to say is your customer service team can't be the place that I get trapped for four days, right? And if I'm constantly saying, no, 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 I don't need my pin reset, you have a bug, right? And I said it in I don't know how many ways. You really have to be able to pick this up because if I get mad, I'm not going away. I'm going deeper, right? Um, and that's the problem with trying to have a, research, a researcher be placated by silence, right? It doesn't work. So finally, I get past customer service and I land on a product manager's desk. Yay, right? We set up a phone call. <laughs> I dial into it and I explain everything that I found. I explain, you know, basically I can open a garage door. If I can sit near your house and sniff your Wi-Fi, I'm for sure going to get your garage door. Uh, but there's a little known fact about how all these apps work. They constantly log in. So 
a little while ago when Florida had that hurricane come ripping through and all of the telecom companies turned on free Wi-Fi and made it wide open access, man, I'd have loved to have been sitting down there to watch everyone's passwords for their banks get flying through there, watch all the push notifications cross the network, right? Um, because there was then no protection, right? If I get in, I control the access to the house, not just the garage. Now granted, the garage is pretty interesting. My garage got an old Volkswagen in it, a chainsaw, an ax, right? These aren't things I want just anybody grabbing and trying to come through the door, but it doesn't matter, I'll unlock the door anyway, right? Because I use the outside as my protection. Um, so I explain to these guys, hey, you know, I'm just looking to see if you've done something that makes my house less secure. And they told me, security is our number one priority, Mr. Kent. And I said, that's great. How many security guys are on the call? <laughs> Zero. They don't have a security team and they've never tested their application, right? They make a machine that lifts the door because you're too lazy to get out of your car, right? But then they put it on the internet and that step meant something that they weren't anticipating. So eventually they're gonna get to you, or maybe not. Maybe they're gonna get frustrated and turn away Right, um, but if, if they get through to you, um, you're gonna be basically at that point in the middle of an incident response, right? You need to treat, it, treat this like it's an incident. Um, the security team, product management, you know, you're gonna wanna go talk to the researcher and don't approach them like, I have all the legal right in the world to sue you, what are you calling me for? right? Approach them with a little bit of humbleness and a little bit of thank you for telling us, right? Um, you have to be a little bit careful here because if your first step is to call the lawyers, right? I mean, all of us in the room take a bite out of the chair a little bit when somebody says lawyer, right? If I'm on the other end of this, I know I'm open to get sued. Um, don't, don't do that. Right, don't call the lawyers. Um, maybe <laughs> you could have an adult discussion with them. So as an example of this, there's a guy named Jan Olberg, uh, who's Finnish or Swedish, I can never remember which. Um, and he goes around looking for cross-site scripting on websites. If you open up your web logs, you're gonna see this guy for sure banging on your website, trying to find cross-site scripting. And if he finds it, he's very good about reporting it to you if he can figure that out, right? And if you fix it, he's very good about tweeting that you have fixed it. In 30 days though, he tweets you have it. And he doesn't care, right? You get 30 days uh, from the first time that he notifies you until he tweets it. So I worked for a security company that we decided we're gonna move our blog onto a different platform. And when we did that, the developer that put it together forgot to put request.validate in on all the search parameters, and we ended up with cross-site scripting. Jan called us, and I said, well, what do you want, man? You know, like, what's the thing that you want? You want us to pay you for this? You want a t-shirt? You know, <laughs> what is it? And he's like, I don't want cross-site scripting. <laughs> that, that's what I want, <laughs> right? He's very altruistic and he just doesn't like this menace, right? And he wants to get rid of it. And it could very well be that the researcher that's phoning you just wants it fixed, right? And so a promise of I'm gonna fix it might be the thing that'll, that'll get you there. So calling the lawyers is probably going to be their worst fear unless you're somebody like Jan that lives in a country where that, what he's doing isn't illegal, right? Um, he's allowed to do this thing, so he's gonna do it anyway. Um, but it really depends, right? When somebody calls you, we often go through this phase, uh, or phase change, if you will. Um, this is called the direct curve. Uh, this is for people that are experiencing change, right? So if you think about my company that has the machine that lifts the door, um, when I first called them, they said, well, that's not a problem, right? Uh, it looks really hard to do. They had a bunch of this kind of stuff and they basically told me um, they didn't care, right? And I had to take them through the next couple of steps just to get them to start looking at this thing. 
So when I first called them, they were firmly planted in denial, right? <laughs> this is the headwaters of the Nile. This is where we do a lot of our work in Africa. Um, they were firmly planted here. That looks really hard to do. What is this burp thing, right? The internet, that's still around. I mean, they really didn't have a good grasp of this. And so it was up to me to explain to them why it was a bad thing, right? Big clue here, if a researcher calls you and says you have a problem, you have it, <laughs> right? Um, that's really hard to do is what I get, right? How many of you guys have received or given pen testing reports and the answer on the other side is who would do that, right? <laughs> yeah, hackers, that's who, right? The people that want in. Denial doesn't affect change, right? This doesn't move us forward. We have to try to get to the point where we're actually trying to change, right? Um, which means we've got to move through this direct curve kind of as fast as we can. Um, but if you call a researcher's research impossible or difficult or whatever, let me let you in on something. They know that, right? They spent months doing this. Um, and so they know how hard it is to do. They're trying to simplify it for you. And if it's your lawyers that are on the phone, they want to understand it. So dig into the researcher's motivation. Maybe they're looking for a job. Maybe you need to hire them, right? This might be a good thing. Maybe it isn't, right? You don't want to accept this as extortion for sure. Oftentimes it's just bragging rights, right? I hacked a thing. Yay, right? And then you move on. Um, in my case, I wanted to go get a good talk at DEF CON, right? Go hack stuff so you can get on the stage, whatever, right? I wanted to figure out if nobody's going to break into my house. Do they want a t-shirt? Do they want a bounty? Do they want your legal team to write them a note? I, you know, call them and ask them, right? And have a good conversation with them. But if at any point the researcher goes adversarial and starts to try to extort you, call the police immediately. Do not negotiate with them. Right? They're not there for your benefit. They're trying to do something else. Go after them. Right? Um, and I think that that's something that not enough organizations really understand is if they catch an attacker, they just sort of brush them away. And it's like, no, we need to put some penalties behind this so we don't see so much of that. So I had a phone call with these guys. That meeting went well. Right? Um, me and the lawyers and the product manager. The team will now go away and validate what I have told them I can do is actually something that someone can do, right? Again, this is one of those points where it's like, I've spent a lot of time on this. To me, it sounds like you're trying to get me to just go away. And I got to warn you, man, if you start to do this to a researcher, keep this in mind. It's a trap, right? You're going to be putting a bad face to the researcher, um, and the researcher is going to be aggravated by it. Right? Um, and you really don't want something like that. Silence is not gold right, in these situations. Ignoring them means you don't care as much as they do about the problem you have. Right? I mean, that really is what it is. Um, so during the Chamberlain disclosure, I called them and said, you know, you guys haven't looked at this. We've reached a point where I'm out of responsible disclosure. I'm no longer going to redact your name from my slides. I'm going to tell everyone about who you are and what this problem is. And they said, hey, it's CES week. We're super busy. <laughs> so you're going and selling more of this thing that's broken? Excellent. You know, do you tell them it's broken? Um, and so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why aren't they answering my emails, <laughs> right? Why aren't they listening to this thing? I told them that my house now has a vulnerability because of them. Give us more time, please, before you disclose. Sure. The standard responsible disclosure in our industry is 30 days. If I call you and tell you there's a flaw, you have 30 days, right? But I know for a fact that they weren't ready for me to call. Right? So I was trying to be nice to them. But in reality, they were just trying to get me to you know, move on to the silence phase where we don't talk to each other anymore. But something that you should keep in mind, keep your enemies close. 
If somebody has spent a long time picking at this wound that you have, maybe they got a little deeper and figured out a better way to execute, right? Maybe uh, they've dug down into your systems and understand that you have no security practices, right? It could very well be that you're going to make them mad, and that's probably not the best motivation that a researcher is going to have. Um, you know, I was, I was just in San Francisco uh, with a client, and it was during Dreamforce. Does everybody know what Dreamforce is? Has anybody ever heard of Salesforce.com? Salesforce.com throws this shindig every year that makes Black Hat look like a tiny little party shoved in a closet. Right? The entire city is affected by it. The hotel that I tend to stay at costs $120 a night, was $904 a night. I ended up having my plans changed and I needed to check out of my hotel early. I walked down the front desk and said, hey, I gotta check out of my hotel early. Now, I, I travel a ton. I'm an elite level traveler. This is normal, right? They normally are very nice about this. And they're like, tell you what we'll do. We'll only charge you half for tonight. And I said, if you charge me more than zero, it will be my room for tonight. You will not rent it out, right? I'll sit a camera in there and <laughs> I'll happily wait for you to open the door, right? But now the researcher's motivation has changed. So I look at the back of my door. You ever stay in a hotel that has a little placard that says the maximum rate that they can charge you for the room on it? Guess what? They were charging me more than that amount. So I went down there and said, oh, and by the way, since you want to treat me like this, you can't charge me $450 a night for this room. It's $399.99, it's the max rate, it's on the back of the door, right? <laughs> and they were like, oh, this is my idea of don't make the researcher mad because they're going to find new motivations, right? Um, they're going to start to go look at this thing in a different way. I also tweeted to at Dreamforce, everyone look at the back of your room door, right? So as you can imagine, checkout the next day was probably fun for all these hotels, right? All up and down uh, the peninsula in San Francisco. You need to make sure that you're treating this like an ongoing incident. There should be a product for a project manager associated with it. There should be someone on the security team that's tasked with following up, right? This is an incident that's going on. Communication is extremely important. Turning it off just changes the way things are, right? Resistance is futile. Eventually, they say, maybe you're right. Maybe we do have this problem. Yeah, maybe. So they said, well, I see you spent some time on this. They still don't really believe it's something that they need to go fix. Any idea why they have such reticence to go fix it? They don't know how. It costs money. <laughs> yeah. They literally can't. Um, and so what it was was they needed to code a new change ship a new mobile app, right? Like it was a bunch of things and they had bought all this, right? So the researcher had found something that they had purchased and they didn't have good contracts for security inside of it. That meant they had to go purchase another one. But at least we started moving through the curve, right? So now we're on resistance to change. Well, there's some kind of change, but uh, I don't really want to act on it now. When I was first, uh, employed in the information technology realm. I worked for a, a place called UUNet. Um, I, I controlled most of the domain naming system on the internet and a lot of the traffic. Um, and one of the ladies that I worked with one day, they said, we're gonna move you from this office to that office. And she said, no, you're not, right? And locked herself in her office. You're an adult. <laughs> you're moving. Right? And it took a long time to get her up to commitment, right? where she actually moved down to the next office. But it was crazy to watch, and people are like that, right? Like that's how people are. Um, the researcher is often here to help, and I was here to help. I called you because I want to help. Please know that, right? Um, if you can't figure it out, ask the researcher to show you again. Ask the researcher to instrument your environment. Ask the researcher to help you set it up because that's going to be really important, right? Their biggest snag was burp. In order to split their cert, you gotta import the burp cert to trust it, right? Um, and that, they had difficulty with that. I got on the phone with them, you know, export it, okay, email it to yourself, right, click it, there you go. Um, but, you know, if you don't know how to do it, it takes a second. 
Um, if you believe that this thing isn't important, right, ask how it can impact. What, what's the real risk here? Well, I could sit outside somebody's house and open their garage door, right? Like, it's pretty simple. Um, probably in an uncontrolled way, in a way that you don't expect it. Um, but that researcher, you need to at least offer some sort of compensation if it's not just, you know, we'll put you on our kudos page or whatever. The next phase is called exploration, right? And then exploration, the key phrases that you're going to hear are things like, well, we've given this some thought. What would you do, right? So I make a bunch of suggestions or I give them a path to remediation in some way. I've put a lot of thought into this, right? I've spent time with it. Um, where can we go for help, right? Who could help us with this problem? These are really good questions and they, they make me believe that, yeah, we're now moving through the curve and we are accepting the need for change, right? They're exploring the situation and understanding that this is a real problem and we need to go solve it. Um, but they're not quite there. Moving forward in their case meant shifting into forward. Right? They weren't doing anything to begin with. The researcher is probably going to offer solutions. I offered them a bunch of solutions. Pin the cert, go get a pen test, you know, <laughs> um, figure out what's wrong with the code. And they started responding with different questions. Right? But you have to remember that solutions have impact, some kind of impact. So take, for instance, crack. Right? Does anybody know what crack is? What is it? New Wi-Fi vulnerability built into Wi-Fi since WPA2 came out. Um, if you have something running WPA2 today, it's probably vulnerable to crack. How do you fix it? Patch it. You got to patch it. Okay. We tell enterprises to do this all the time, right? Go patch your servers. How many of you have something that's vulnerable to crack right now? Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> right? Uh, so how do we fix it? How do we know it's fixed? How do you know that the firmware is ready? How do you know the vendor fixed it, right? This is not a simple problem. And by the way, this is how enterprises are dealing with things. Um, think about the car hacking stuff, the impact that it had. How many of you guys have heard about Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek hacking the cars? Okay, so over a Wi-Fi, or sorry, over a mobile phone connection, they were able to connect directly to a vehicle and SSH into it, change the firmware on the vehicle to their own modified firmware because Fiat doesn't believe in code signing, right? And it was air-gapped. Air well, software air-gapped. <laughs> um, they went after that thing looking for a flaw. They found one. What happened, though? Look at the impact of their research. Sprint had to change the way that network worked, right? They had to redesign a network that was already in place because of the vulnerability, right? Uh, Chrysler, Fiat, whatever their name is, had to go send a recall notification out. A million and a half cars had to go get their firmware upgraded. And some people, they didn't go. So what did they do? This is my best, this is the best part of this. They emailed USB keys around and said, plug this into your car, which Charlie then immediately copied with his own firmware, made copies of the notification, and started mailing them out, right? <laughs> the impact is huge, maybe, right? Think about ATMs, right? Think about ATMs just for a minute. I'm not the first guy that has disclosed a problem, and I'm, not, I'm probably not the last. Right, but a good example of this is Barnaby Jack. Barnaby flaw, found a flaw in an ATM, right? I can dump this thing. I can make the motors turn on and shoot the money out, right? Now, if you're an ATM company, that's not good, right? But if you're an ATM company, how many endpoints do you have? Millions. They're plugged in on modem lines and gas stations. They're plugged into banks. They're plugged into, you know, who knows what kind of kiosks? Anybody been to Vegas? There's ATMs, those bill changer weird machines, right? So there's a lot of this impact that's out there. Barnaby calls, the ATM company says, okay, we'll fix that, right? So they start working on a fix or they start waiting to fix it. We were not sure of the timeline that they had to fix it, um, but he was gonna go to DEF CON and talk about this thing, right? <coughs> 
Now they got the lawyers involved, right? They issue a cease and desist letter. It's too hard to go fix all these things. It is, right? Um, so what ended up happening was it delayed a year, right? Barnaby waited until the next year. Um, they had to go fix all the stuff. And it was Diebold ATMs, it was NCR ATMs, and you know, cashing an ATM out, right, is huge news. Everyone looked at this thing. Um, and they had to have it fixed anywhere that they could. Turns out there's additional flaws in these systems, um, but this was just you know, an example of hey, it's hard to fix, right? For my company, it was simple to fix. They just need to put a fix in their mobile app and send it out, right? P republish a new app, not that hard. All right, so 30 days, 60 days, 120 days, whatever time the researcher's giving you, eventually, time's up, right? Eventually, they're gonna start talking about it. They're gonna either talk about it with their peer group or they're gonna talk about it in a situation like this, right? Um, the fun thing about that is you lose control of that, right? You're sort of in control when you're in the middle of this direct curve in the first three phases. But when time is up, you lose control of the information and it's important to have that sink in. You're going to lose control of this. They're going to tweet about it. They're, they're going to say stuff about it. Think about Equifax, right? They lost control of the fact that 143 million records of the US public have been stolen from a database that none of us opted into. That information made their CEO go on stage and say, yeah, we probably should have done a better job of that, right? Uh, he sat in front of Congress and said, scanner missed it. Right? Um, losing control of the information means you have to react, and if you're bad at that, you're gonna sound like those guys did. But he got $85 million to quit, so that'll teach him, right? <laughs> Key words for I'm in the exploring phase. Uh, we have additional questions, right? Um, problematic architecture stuff. They had these APIs that when you read the API calls, you were like, okay, garage door open, garage door closed. Like, you know, none of this stuff is obfuscated. It's so easy to pick apart. Um, I can get, you know, all kinds of data off of this. We need to do something else, right? Do you recommend someone to look at this? I told them to call Samsung, right? Because the Samsung smart things is probably the most sophisticated API I've ever seen. Um, and it's well done. Right? Whoever did that architecture and put all that together, by the way, it's Samsung internally, um, kudos to them. And you should call them and they should share with you how they did this because it's quite good. Um, eventually they said, you know, are you willing to look at something else or if we do fix it, um, are you willing to validate that it has been fixed? And I agreed to that, right? I have yet to speak to them again. I know it's been fixed because I test it all the time, um, but they have never called me back. The last phase of this is commitment. Yeah, we're gonna fix it, right? We are committed to doing this change. We understand that, it, that it's uh, you know, us moving forward. We gotta focus on the future. And so once you hit that commitment phase, you are going to you know, fix up whatever it is that you uh, have problems with. But be ready for this, right? Because committing means we gotta fix all the ATMs, or we gotta fix all the cars, or maybe we have a solution in place that we should ask this researcher, is this a good way to fix this, right? If they had called, if Chrysler had called Charlie and said, hey, we're gonna mail USB keys around with this letter, Charlie would have said, don't do that, <laughs> right? He would have said, let me just fix it over the air. I know how to do that, <laughs> right? I mean, he literally could have fixed everybody's cars through SSH. You drive past the any cell tower and it would have got fixed. So Chamberlain went back and they tightened up security. Uh, I put up there sort of. Um, they made it so you couldn't split their cert open easily anymore. And I'm kind of okay with that and kind of not, right? I haven't dug into this any further, um, partially because they haven't called me and said, okay, it's fixed. Um, but partially because I, if I keep picking on them, it's just gonna sound weird, right? Um, you gotta find the next company to pull the next gag on. But they did put in one thing that I was really happy about. 
if you have, if you prevent a, present a session token and an invalid cert, they invalidate the session. So if you're monkeying around too much, they keep logging you out, which does in fact add time and does in fact keep the researchers away a little bit, right? Step one or half, however you want to say that. Um, but it does make it so that I can't so easily go bang on this thing. Now I haven't op opened it up with like mobile edit or anything like that to look, are they storing their API keys in the clear or anything? Um, but I have a feeling that all of that's going on too. So for you, once you get to this commit phase, it's a good idea to look back and post-mortem this thing. How'd we do, right? Um, when you start working on a problem, you're gonna have a better thing, and that's good. Um, but look back and say, how'd you get a hold of us, right? How did you hear about the conference? Um, how, did you, how did you find us? Did we do a good job with that? Because if you didn't, it's a good idea to start making it so that you have security.txt or whatever that thing is, right? At any point where you're dismissive of the researcher's research, it's a good question to ask yourself, right? Being dismissive of somebody's research is crazy, right? When Charlie, before he was hacking cars, he was hacking NFC uh, and found all these flaws with NFC and Android, right? Um, they, never, uh, they never really looked at it as a flaw. They're like, well, NFC kind of touches a kernel and touches a kernel, so yeah, yeah, you can't, can't get away from it. You have to think, don't be dismissive, right? Um, did you have any level of appreciation? <laughs> uh, the, alternate, the alternative here, uh, and I make this joke all the time, is that your intrusion detection is gonna be brought to you by Brian Krebs, right? Um, he's going to go to the media and say, I, there's this thing. Uh, so what you want to try to do is make sure that you are appreciative of the disclosure, of them doing the process of disclosure, right? Because they don't have to. They can just totally put it on Twitter and, you know, send it out to the world. Um, did this disclosure help you find other problems, right? As you went to fix it, did you find other flaws or did you think of things different way? Um, and did you apply any different techniques? And in the last case here, Say thank you to the researcher, right? I have never heard back from Chamberlain. Though they have fixed the app uh, in their way, they have never ever called me and said, thank you for telling us and being, you know, slow with the way that you went and talked about this. And it, it doesn't hurt me personally, but it hurts me from the perspective of help each other, right? Jack this morning in his keynote said, be kind to each other and help each other. That's what I'm trying to do, right? I do this with my personal life, I do this with my professional life. At least be appreciative or be, do a kindness to someone else. In summary, you need to look at your attack points and understand your perimeter and understand that you may be injecting a change to that. Chamberlain's case, they didn't have anything connected to the internet and then suddenly they had everything connected to the internet, right? All of a sudden you could go to Home Depot and put your garage door opener online. Make sure you're approachable. I need to be able to find you, right? If I figure out that I can you know, dump an ATM by taking a gift card and turning some bit somewhere, and I tell you about it, be appreciative of that uh, and see if you can figure out how to fix it. Perhaps get on their side. Bug Crowd has bug bounty programs, and I know everybody gets a little leery about this, but they have bug bounty programs where you don't have to pay money, right? Um, they do literally have a 13-year-old Pakistani kid that's amazing with computers that will sit in Pakistan and bang on your website for 50 bucks, right? Please, come up with the 50 bucks, right? <laughs> this kid will be super happy when he finds something. Give him the money, right? This, this is research that you can't do on your own, um, and it's research that you probably can't find the skills for. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff that we have to, you know, figure out. So this is sort of the end of my talk. Um, but I want you to understand that I want to help people. I like being kind and helping others. It helps me, right? If you've ever helped somebody and felt good about that, that feeling is addictive, get addicted to it. So if you're shy, you don't want to talk to me right now, you want to talk to me later, I'm happy to do that, right? If you want to go sit down and have beers and bang on some mobile app, I'd love to do that. If you want to join me on my new quest, uh, I was in an Uber, 
uh, riding to a, a speaker's dinner in Texas, and the guy driving asked me if I liked the music that was on. I listened to it for a little while, and it's not really my jam, but I said, yeah, this is nice, I like it. Tell me about yourself. He's an independent Spotify artist. Interesting. So he tells me that if you climb the ranks in Spotify, you start to get record deals. More interesting, right? Now all of a sudden I'm interested. Why? Spotify has APIs. They communicate to other applications, right? Wouldn't it be neat if I could make my Uber driver famous, right? <laughs> if anybody wants to come with me on this trip, we're gonna do it. <laughs> I'm not standing here because I myself am anything. Many, many, many people got me here. The people that educated me, the people that supported me, the people that I've worked with. Worked with Frank for a long time. He carried the water while I was doing research. Um, this is the kind of stuff that you have to have a good understanding of. Being kind to everyone and making sure that we all have good understanding is my goal, and I hope someday that it's yours. Much love to the B-Side staff. Uh, this isn't easy to do. Granted, it's a couple of rooms and we try to get 300 people in it. Go ahead, throw yourself a party for 300 people and tell me how much of a headache it is, right? So make sure that you understand um, that they are here. Keep in mind, everybody that has stood in front of you today, seven months ago said, I want to try to go talk there, right? And then we had to have a talk ready and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so keep uh, all of the guys that are up here speaking and gals um, in your, in your uh, mind. There's a couple vendors outside. They kick in enough money to make sure you can rent the place and all that. Visit them, talk to them. Even if you don't like their products, understand what part of the market they're going after. Understand what you're doing to address that part of the market in your organization. Uh, if it's fishing, like the Fish Labs guys, you know, are you doing a campaign? If not, should you, right? Um, I've seen plenty of people click in the link, right? Uh, you send them, there's a problem with your time off request, they all click that link. I'm, I'm telling you right now. Um, so thanks for attending. You guys spent some time with me today. Uh, that's really important to me, and I really appreciate it. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, though I'm probably bashing uh, United, um, or I'm Jason at HackerForCharity.org. Thanks for your time today, guys. Appreciate it.